Hi, welcome to our next unit in AP Art History. We are going to be looking at the art of South, Central, East, and Southeast Asia. It's quite an extensive unit, and we're going to be jumping um, from different geographical locations. We're going to be looking at different religions, such as Buddhism and Hinduism. It's quite a, a, an intensive but very fascinating um, unit in our um, art history course. So we're going to be looking um, at the art of China first. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, China before Buddhism, in particular funerary art. So imperial Chinese history is marked by the rise and fall of many dynasties and occasional periods of disunity. But overall, the age was remarkably stable and marked by a sophisticated governing system that included the concept of mediocrity, mediocrity. Each dynasty had its own distinct characteristics and in many eras encountered um, with foreign culture and political influences through territorial expansion and waves of immigration also brought new stimulus to China. China had a highly literate society that greatly valued poetry and brush written calligraphy, which along with painting were called the three perfections. Reflecting the esteemed position of the arts in Chinese life, Imperial China produced many technological advancements that have enriched the world, including paper and porcelain. So there were three um, dominant religions um, throughout um, the history of China, Confucianism, Daoism, and Buddhism. Confucianism is a way of life taught by Confucius, also known as Kong Fuzi in China in the 6th and 5th century BCE, and the rituals and traditions associated with him. Sometimes viewed as a philosophy, sometimes as a religion, Confucianism is perhaps best understood as an all-encompassing humanism that is compatible with other forms of religion. Confucianism has deeply influenced spiritual and political life in China. Its influences have also extended to Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. East Asians may profess themselves to be um, Shinoist, Taoist, Buddhist, Muslims, or Christians, but seldom do they cease to be Confucians. Confucianism um, concerned itself primarily with ethical principles and does not address many traditional <clears throat> religious beliefs. These are greatly provided by Chinese religions, Taoism, Buddhism, or other religions which um, Confucian Confucians follow. However, Confucius regarded heaven, which um, was called teen, T apostrophe I E N, as a positive and personal force in the universe. He was not, as some have supposed, an agnostic or a skeptic. He also taught a highly optimistic view of human nature and potential. <clears throat> Daoism is also spelled Taoism. Um, it is a religion or philosophical tradition of Chinese origin which emphasizes living in the harmony with the Tao, literally, which translates into way or the way. Um, the Tao is a fundamental idea in most um, Chinese philosophical, philosophical schools. In Taoism, however, it denotes the principles that um, is best, that is both the source, pattern, and substance of everything that exists. Taoism differs from Confucianism by not emphasizing rigid rituals and social order. Taoist ethics vary depending on the particular school, but in general tend to emphasize Wu Wei, which translates to effortless action, naturalness, simplicity, spontaneity, and the three treasures, compassion, frugality, and humility. We'll talk about Buddhism a little bit later when we focus more on um, the art of um, Buddhism. So our first piece is an extraordinary um, um, funerary mausoleum. Um, the first emperor, King Xing Hao, and I, again, I probably am butchering these names, so forgive me, um, who reigned from 259 um, to 210 BCE, conquered much in this life. But his driving purpose was even greater. He sought to conquer death. In order to achieve immortality, he built himself a tomb, a vast underground city guarded 
by life-size a life-size terracotta, terracotta army, including warriors, infantrymen, horses, chariots, and all their attendants, armor, and weaponry. So you have sort of an aerial view right now. How does this tomb differ from others? The first emperor's army and burial complex were part of a grand scheme to create the entire world of the court below. The pits contained the soldiers, also included charioteers and stables. The emperor's tomb itself, yet to be unearthed, is supposed to contain a working model of the entire palace compound, set with traps to ward off looters. The first emperor was obsessed with immortality during his reign, so his burial complex was provisioned with all that was important to him on his journey to the next world. Obviously, his army was extremely important, and it was thought it was through military conquest that he built his empire. The burial complex also signaled a direct direction toward the use of ceramic models as stand-ins for sacrificial victims, a process that had begun earlier but reached gigantic proportions here. The use of ceramic models of soldier armies continued into the Han Dynasty. Um, tombs to be filled with objects representing real things and the ability to prepare such a burial complex would, in the Han Dynasty, Han Dynasty become the dream of an, of an increasingly border segment of society. Here we have a more detailed view. The underground terracotta army found in the first emperor's burial complex is undoubtedly one of the most remarkable and mysterious discoveries from the ancient world. A sprawling citadel has been unearthed, complete with gardens and stables, bronze um, ritual vessels, jade jewelry, and a wealth of gold and silver ornaments. Besides revealing much about an ancient way of life, observing the physical construction of the underground complex and the methodical production of figures reveals a set of themes from which we gain a window of the insight to the first emperor's worldview and enduring influence. The first emperor known for stunning innovations that consolidated um, his rule through modernization. Um, during his reign, he introduced the standardization of currency, writing, measurements, and more. He connected cities and states with advanced system of roads and canals. He also created, um, with continuing, the he also he is also credited with continuing the construction of the Great Wall, which is perhaps the most widely known symbol still associated with China today. He is regarded as a military genius. And while his methods include massacre and destruction, some claim that his ultimate success at bringing the states together justifies the violence and necessary cost of nation building. We also see the first assembly line um, style production in the creation of his terracotta warriors, horses, and chariots. So, Obviously, one of our themes that we're going to be exploring in this unit is this idea of immortality. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of the burial complex is what it suggests about the young emperor's obsession with immortality. Driven to conquer death itself, the eventual first emperor ascended to the throne of the kin state at the age of 13 and immediately began to plan his burial, and more importantly, his underground palace, a mausoleum attended by an army including over 7,000 terracotta warriors, horses, chariots, and weaponry intended to protect him in the afterlife. The first emperor envisioned a subterranean domain that would parallel his worldly existence after a corporeal death. So we have this idea of the afterlife. And so one of the themes we're going to be ex exploring in other ancient cultures is, is how um, individuals and societies thought about immortality and, and the afterlife and often how they really spent a great deal of their physical corporeal lives preparing for it. According to the Han Dynasty historian Sima, um, Sima um, Qian, the first emperor lined his burial complex with a treasury of riches and piles of precious gemstones, 
said to represent the stars, sun, and moon. He was deeply concerned with the universe and looked to the cosmos as a guide for crossing over to an immortal existence. Excavation also revealed that other mysterious findings likely strangely like strangely high levels of mercury and evidence and evidence that the poison substance coursed through the intricate system of the underground troughs replicating the typography of the actual rivers and seas carving the surrounding landscape some suggest that the emperor believed mercury had life-giving powers and so surrounded himself with the toxic element believing it was yet another way he might live forever Of all the accomplishments from this extraordinary period, the unification of China is without question the greatest symbol of the Qin dynasty power and influence. Born in a time of turmoil in China's history known as the Warrior States period between 475 and 221 BCE, the first emperor founded the short-lived Qin dynasty from 221 to 206 BCE. By 221 BCE, he merged the seven um, warring states into one nation and took the name King Sheng Hong, which means first emperor. He left a legacy of centralized and bureaucratic state, um, a legacy of a centralized and bureaucratic state that would be carried on to successive dynasties over the next two millennia. Prior to his taking the throne, the Qin state had been in existence for over half a century. Under the single clan Ying, but never under the rule of one individual. The rulers of the state of Qin, Qin had gradually expanded their domain over the centuries, but the slow effort, um, but the slow effort culminated in, in the ultimate victory when the first emperor succeeded in uniting the once divided empire. Here you're looking at um, an armored kneeling archer. So you can actually see the details. And again, this is extraordinary work. And the and you know, think about the skill and also the the amounts of artisans and people that would have would have had to have been employed to produce um, this kind of scale and mass production. When the burial complex was first discovered by farmers in 1974, archaeologists set to work on one of the most astonishing ancient sites on record. The excavation uncovered a sprawling citadel with thousands of warriors, each designed with a unique face and clothing. In addition to the warriors themselves, the dig uncovered horses, chariots, bronze ritual vessels, jade jewelry, and golden and silver ornaments. According to the historian Sima, Sima um, Yin, Qian, the emperor so feared that his artisans might disclose all the treasures that um, was in the tomb that after the burial, that after the burial, that after the burial and sealing up of the treasures, the middle gate was shut and the outer gate closed to imprison all the artisans and laborers so that no one came out. That's, that's pretty crazy. Um, the first emperor's burial complex is a spectacular find, but many questions remain unanswered. Why was the first emperor so obsessed with immortality um, and defense even in death? What do you suppose lies in his tomb, and why do you think the Chinese have not opened it yet? What effect did the creation of the first emperor's terracotta army have on, a, on burial customs after his dynasty? The story of the burial complex is also fascinating because it conceived it was conceived by such a very young individual. Court records reveal that despite taking the throne at the age of 13 in 246 BCE, the eventual emperor ordered construction to begin almost immediately. Enormous numbers of laborers worked on the project, which was halted as the dynasty neared collapse. To date, Four pits have been partially excavated. Three contain terracotta soldiers, horse-drawn chariots, and weapons. The fourth pit was found empty, a testament to the original unfinished construction. One of the most extraordinary features of the terracotta warriors is that each appears to have distinct features, an incredible feat of craftsmanship and production. 
Despite the custom um, construction of these figures, studies of their proportion reveal that they are frame that their frames were created using an assembly production system that paved the way for advances in mass production and commerce. Archaeologists estimate that the objects, including figures, horses, and weapons, numbered in the thousands, though the true total may never be known. So our next object that we're going to be looking at is a beautiful um, funerary um, banner of the Lady Da from the second century BCE. And so a lot of times when we think of um, death and the afterlife, there's, there's this idea of maybe I can bring it with me <laughs> um, if you're rich enough. Uh, and that's um, a theme that we see with a lot of ancient rulers. Um, the elite men and women of the Han Dynasty, China's second imperial dynasty um, that ranged from 206 BCE to 220 CE, enjoyed an opulent lifestyle that could stretch into the afterlife. Today, the well-furnished tombs of the elite give us a glimpse of the luxurious goods um, they treasured and enjoyed. For instance, a wealthy official could afford beautiful silk robes in contrast to the homespun or paper garments of a laborer or peasant. Their tombs also informed us about the cosmological, their cosmological beliefs. So three elite tombs discovered in 1972 at Mawang, um, Mawangdao, the Hunan province, eastern China, ranked among the, the greatest archaeological discoveries in China during the 20th century. They are the tombs of a high-ranking Han official civil servant, um, the Marquis of Da, Lady Da, his wife, and their son. The Marquis died in 186 BCE, and his wife and son both died by 163 BCE. The Marquis's tomb was not in good condition when it was discovered. However, the objects in the son's and wife's tombs were, ex were of extraordinary quality and very well preserved. From these objects, we can see that Lady Da and her son were to spend the afterlife in sumptuous comfort. So what we're looking at are some nesting coffins, and nesting coffins are usually the idea that one fits um, into the other. In Lady Daw's tomb, archaeologists found a painted silk banner over six feet long in excellent condition. The T-shaped banner was on top of the innermost of four nesting coffins, which we just looked at. Although the scholars still debate the function of these banners, we know they had some connection with the afterlife. Um, they, may have, they may be name banners used to identify the dead during, the morning during morning ceremonies, or they may have been burial shrouds intended to aid the soul in its passage to the afterlife. Lady Daw's banner is important for two primary reasons. It is an early example of pictorial this idea of representing naturalistic scenes, not just abstract shapes. Um, so this idea of pictorial art in China. Secondly, the banner features the earliest known portrait in Chinese painting. We can divide Lady Da's banner into four horizontal registers. And so registers are sort of these scenes going horizontally across the composition. And so you can sort of see the diagram of how um, the scenes are divided up. So there's a heavenly realm up here in this very top register, Lady Da and her attendants, um, the body of Lady Da with mourners, and then at the very bottom, which makes sense, this representation of the underworld. In the lower central register, we see Lady Da in an embroidered silk robe leaning on a staff. This remarkable portrait of Lady Da is the earliest example of a painted portrait of a specific individual in China. She stands on a platform along with her servants, two in front and three behind. Our next detail, here we look at a long sinuous dragons um, and how they frame the scene on either side and their white and pink bodies loop through a ba a bai, B-I, 
which translates into a disc with a hole um, thought to represent the sky. Underneath Lady Da, we understand that this is not a portrait of Lady Da in her former life, but an image of her in the afterlife, enjoying the immortal comforts of her tomb as she ascends towards the heavens. In the register below the scene of Lady Da, we see a sacrificial funerary rituals taking place in the morning hall. Tripod containers and vase-shaped vessels for offering food and wine stand in the foreground. In the middle ground, seated mourners line up in two rows. Um, look for the mound in the center between the two rows of mourners. If you look closely, you can see the pattern on the silk that match the robe Lady Di, Lady Di wears in the scene above. Her corpse is wrapped in her finest robe. More vessels appear on a shelf in the background. In the morning scene, we can also appreciate the importance of Lady Da's banner for understanding how artists began to represent death, depth, <laughs> and space in early Chinese painting. They made efforts to indicate depth through the use of overlapping bodies of the mourners, which you can kind of see here. They also made objects in the foreground larger and objects in the background smaller to create the illusion of space in the morning hall. Lady Da's banner gives us some insight into cosmological beliefs and funerary practices of Han Dynasty China. Above and below the scene of Lady Da in the morning hall, we see images of heaven and the underworld. <coughs> Excuse me. For the top near the cross of the T, two men face each other and guard the gate to the heavenly realm. Directly above the two men at the very top of the banner, we see a deity with a human head and a dragon body. On the left, a toad standing on a crescent moon flanks the dragon, human deity. On the right, we see what may be a three-legged crow within a pink sun. The moon and the sun are emblematic of a supernatural realm above the human world. Dragons and other immortal beings populate the sky. In the lower register beneath the morning hall, we see the underworld populated by two giant um, blackfish, a red snake, a pair of blue goats, and an unidentified earthly deity. The deity appears to hold up the floor. Sorry. Um, the deity appears to hold up the floor of the morning hall while the two fish cross to form a circle beneath him. The beings in the underworld symbolize water um, and earth, and they indicate an underground domain between the human world. Four compartments surround Lady Da's central tomb, and they offer some sense of the life she was expected to lead in the afterlife. The top compartment represented a room where Lady Di was supposed to sit while having her meal. In this compartment, compartment researchers found cushions, an armrest, and her walking stick. The compartment also contained a meal laid out for her to eat in the afterlife. So it's pretty extravagant. Lady Di was 50, or 50 years old when she died, but her lavish tomb marked by her funerary banner ensured that she would enjoy the comforts of her earthly life for eternity. All right, so this is part one. Um, in part two, in our segment of um, Asian art, we're gonna be looking or uh, traveling to India. Um, and looking at the birthplace of Hinduism. So stay tuned.